Find Luck and Lock searching the woods. Find Luck and Lock stamp in the book. Find Luck and Lock's hike up the trail. Find Luck and Lock send an email. Find Luck and Lock's in your letterbox and look under rocks and carve rubber blocks. And can you solve the stupid mystery clue? Guess the planter is much smarter than you. Find Luck and Lock search high and low. Find Luck and Lock's where'd the path go? Find Luck and Lock stop look and think. Find Luck and Lock's covered with things. Find Luck and Lock's in your letterbox and look under rocks and carve rubber blocks. And gotta find the clue where is his stash? Oops, I found another geocache. Find Lock and Locks like Cranmer Pool. Find Lock and Locks stamp like a fool. Find Lock and Locks that stamps a beauty. Find Lock and Locks watch out a cootie. Find Lock and Locks in your letter box and look under rocks and carve rubber blocks and counting out your steps or was it paces? Getting smeared over all our faces. Find Lock and Locks. 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 My name's Eliza B., formerly of Seattle, now from just outside of Omaha, Nebraska, and you're listening to Letterpod. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bells swing and jingle bells ring. Snowing and blowing up bushels of fun. Now the jingle hop has... Welcome to Episode 9 of the Letterpod, the Holiday Spectacular. Yes, our opening song was sung by What's the Matter You, and that was his version of the Carol of the Bells called Find Lock and Locks. We have a big show for you today that should help get you in that holiday spirit. First up, we have a letterboxing edition of The Night Before Christmas, written by Ace Blazer and read by Lundy. Then we talk New Year's resolutions with Dear Krabby. We also have a heartwarming story from the trail, when Eliza B. met Santa Claus. Then we have a totally ridiculous version of the 12 Days of Christmas, sung by the Letterboxing Chorus. Let's get started with The Night Before Christmas, read by Lundy. A Boxer's Night Before Christmas by Ace Blazer Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. My children were sleeping and so was my spouse. I sat neath the glow of my trusty desk lamp, near midnight finishing one last hand-carved stamp. As I whittled away tiny pink pieces falling, I smiled to myself on that cold night recalling, an old man I'd met in the mall's parking lot, a few nights ago who was in a tight spot. He seemed somewhat dazed as he paced back and forth, mumbling to himself, now which way is north? I thought, ah, a boxer, I know just what to do, and pointing straight up said, I haven't a clue. His kind bearded face grew a puzzled expression, and I realized this man didn't share my obsession. It seems that I'd gotten our signals quite crossed. He was no letter boxer, he simply was lost. I asked the old gent if he needed a ride. With a wink and a smile, no thanks, he replied. I'm a long way from home, thank you for caring. I was last minute shopping, now I've lost my bearing. I can help you, I said, and without further thought, from my bags I pulled out a new compass I bought. I want you to have this, your needs greater than mine. I've an old one at home, it will serve me just fine. Thank you, he said, this is just what I need. I smiled as we parted. I've done my good deed. Back in the present, my carving now done, I rose from my chair. It was now half past one. I wondered where I'd hide my new yule theme box when there came from my door three or four gentle knocks. I opened the door, and there in the cold was a brand new compass with a case of pure gold. Attached was a note written neatly in red. Thanks for helping. S.C. was all that it said. I stood alone, puzzled, as I looked around, and then from afar came a jingling sound. I then heard a voice I'll recall till the end. Merry Christmas and happy boxing, my friend. You should always help others in need, for you see, you just never can tell who they really may be. Thank you. 
And now for our advice columnist, Dear Krabby. Ms. Krabby, here's today's question. Dear Krabby, what are your letterboxing's New Year's resolutions this year? Signed, looking forward to 2008. They're looking. Krabby doesn't make New Year's resolutions. Hitting the gym every day, saving money instead of indulging in a triple latte, and watching TV? I say a hearty no thanks. Instead, Krabby makes Boxing Day resolutions. For those of you out of the loop, Boxing Day is December 26th. It is a traditional English holiday when the wealthy would honor those who had served them and would give gifts to the poor. But as I am not of the manor born, I simply like the name. So instead of some New Year's resolutions that will be broken and discarded by January 21st, I make Boxing Day resolutions that will hopefully carry a little farther into the new year. Resolution number four, the golden rule time. I resolve to put together a little box of maintenance supplies, extra containers, pre-made logbooks in assorted sizes, tape and baggies all go into the kit. I will carry the kit with me so that I can do repairs on the trail. Resolution number three, be a better friend to hitchhikers. Krabby admits it. She is a bit bored by the proliferation of hitchhikers. She admits to having a few crammed into her letterboxing supply drawer and perhaps other places like the trunk of her automobile and the bottom of her backpack. Instead of letting them languish, I resolve to dig them out, dust them off, and send them away on their merry journey. Resolution number two, carving more than the holiday turkey. Although Krabby is an adequate carver, I resolve to try and stretch and become better. And instead of holding my masterpiece close to my heart or turning it into a postal, I will put it in a box in the wild for others to enjoy. I understand it may go missing, but why do I need another piece of rubber stuffed in my closet? My dog will just chew it. And Krabby's number one Boxing Day Resolution. I resolve to try and be nicer to my fellow letterboxers, particularly newbies. This is a hard one for me because I get frustrated with overzealous people who rush in quickly. I would love it if new letterboxers would do a little research before they ask but I will try to be patient and answer their questions. I will think before I post on the boards, and I will keep my snide comments in private emails to other crusty crustaceans. Just consider it Krabby's effort to spread holiday love and cheer throughout the year. Just don't test me too much. After all... I have pincer claws, and I know how to use them. Thank you, Ms. Krabby. Next, we have Eliza B. and the day she met Santa Claus. In 2002, I met Santa Claus on Cougar Mountain while searching for a letterbox. 2002 had been a particularly rough year for me thus far. My boyfriend, at the time of over a year, had decided that he didn't want any more romantic entanglements, or specifically any more romantic entanglements with me. 
I had injured one of my knees on a particularly suicidal bicycle trip down the Pacific coast. And worst of all, in a few days, I was leaving Seattle for what I thought might be the last time. I was moving back to where I'd grown up. And even though I hadn't grown up in Seattle, I felt like I was born to live there. Leaving on top of everything else was particularly heartbreaking. I'd been driving around aimlessly for hours, saying goodbye to all of the people and the places. When I noticed my bag of letterboxing gear and the printed clues for a cougar mountain box that I still hadn't found, I'd gone to the trailhead against my better judgment, tossing out all of those pesky safety concerns that we learn about, tell people where you're going, or tell people when you'll be back, make sure to take enough water. I was wearing wholly inappropriate shoes, even for an uncharacteristically sunny day in early December. I started off from the trailhead, as the clue told me to. I was hiking, but I was doing more thinking, not really paying attention to where I was going, half-heartedly looking for the clue, looking for the box, looking for something I was definitely not going to find on the trail. I realized about halfway up the four-mile climb that I'd forgotten my water. My water bottle was still sitting in my car two miles back. For some reason, amid all of the other concerns in my life, this felt like a horrifying tragedy. It was an unbearable oversight on my part, and I used it as an excuse to beat myself up further. I sat down on a rock, ironically one that marked part of the clue for the box that I was searching, though I didn't know that at the time, <laughs> and I broke into pitiful, <laughs> messy, jagged sobs. I sat by the side of the trail with my head in my hands, wondering what I was doing and where I was going and was I ever going to see these trees again? Was I ever going to be able to find a clearing and see my city? Or was everything about to change? I heard someone on the trail, wiping my eyes and wiping my nose on my sleeve. I glanced up, and coming up the trail, Santa Claus. It wasn't really Santa Claus, obviously. The Santa coming up the trail was gangly. He was tall and athletic, with limbs that were just a little too long for his body. He had a backpack slewn over one shoulder, a pair of hiking boots on his feet, jeans, a very typical Seattle flannel shirt over a concert t-shirt for a band nobody would ever heard of. On his head, cocked slightly to one side, a red and white furry hat with a white pom-pom that bounced as he walked. He caught sight of me beside the trail, and all of those safety concerns I mentioned before, all of them came back to me. I was pretty convinced that Santa was probably some serial killer who sliced ho 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 into his victims with his custom-made razor knife. Jason introduced himself. He was a hiker, not a letterboxer. He asked when he saw the tear-stained clues in my hand that I'd wiped my eyes on a few moments before, and he explained to me that he had also been driving around for several hours, that that morning he had been at a local children's hospital. He had taken a bag of toys, small stuffed animals that he had found on the cheap at some sort of dollar store, and candy canes to the children there. His best friend from high school had a daughter who was four years old, diagnosed with a particularly invasive form of juvenile leukemia. Over the past several months since she'd been diagnosed, her body had slowly weakened Little bits of her spirit seemed to be falling away from her. And his friend had called him that morning, early, saying that it was the end, that her breathing was becoming labored, that she was unconscious more than she was conscious, that she barely recognized her own family. He'd grabbed the bag of toys, almost as an afterthought, and had thrown the Santa hat on his head. He made his way to the hospital, found his friend and his daughter. He had given her a candy cane and a small stuffed bear, and she'd smiled at him 
not really recognizing him, but recognizing the symbol of Christmas. It was a Christmas she wouldn't reach. She died about 11 o'clock that morning, and Jason, after comforting his friend, had gotten in the car. And much like me, he had driven aimlessly and ended up here, choosing to find solace along a trail. His voice broke while he was telling me his story. He told me how her eyes had lit up and how the horrible disease, how the cancer had eaten away everything that she was, as young as she was. But in the end, when she clutched her bear and her candy, she smiled, he said, when she saw his hat. The leukemia could take even her life, but it couldn't take her joy. We carry our joy with us until the end. Santa reached into his backpack and he handed me a candy cane. He told me to be safe. He wished me a Merry Christmas. And he told me to hold on to my joy. I never did find the Cougar Mountain box that day. The candy canes taped into my trail journal and I still look at it when things seem overwhelming just to remind me of Christmas on the trail, of Santa, of the joy we all carry, and of home. What key are we on? <laughs> okay, listen up, everybody. We've got a song to sing. Let's do the 12 Days of Christmas letterbox style from the top. Take it away, Joy Star. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me an ornament on the letterbox tree. On the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two bob books. And an ornament on the letterbox tree. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three Marvy Markers, two Bob books, and an ornament on the letterbox tree. On the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three Marvy Markers, two Bob books, and an ornament on the letterbox tree. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me five postal rings. Three Marvy Markers, two Bob books, and an ornament on the letterbox tree. Hold on, hold on. This is a great song. Hey, everyone, you're doing great, but this is going to take forever. Let's skip to day 12. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Twelve new exchanges. Eleven stampers stamping. Ten inky fingers. Nine lock and locks. Eight hidden cooties. Seven event patches. Six clues to boxes. Five postal rings. Three, three, Marvy Markers. Two Bob books. And an ornament on the letterbox tree. Great job, everyone. I want to thank the Letter Pod Chorus, made up of Orion, Eliza B., Karen, Cooties, Sapphireberry, Dale and Farm, Ann Tucker, and Joystar. Thank you, everyone. And that's going to wrap up our show for today. I really want to thank you all for listening. The music in this episode came from the Podsafe Music Network. The artists were the Hip Cola with Jingle Bell Rock. Christmas at the Devil's House with Green Sleeves, Tracy Grammer with Winter When He Goes, and Calvin Owens with The Christmas Song. Don't forget, we're always looking for new submissions, so check us out at letterpod.podbean.com or join our Yahoo group, Letterboxing Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and as a special Christmas present to you, here are some outtakes from today's show. Merry Christmas, everyone, and have a happy new year.
testing. Hi, Jack Bear. <laughs> <laughs> a um, flat. E flat. I think we're on E flat now, aren't we? On. Is it. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh, on. Uh, that's too high. Ah. Uh, uh, on. No, that's well. too low. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. I thought you were doing the first one. <laughs> I should totally leave all this in when I send it to him. Okay. <clears throat> Eleven rolls of camel duct tape. Five Ziploc bags. <laughs> Seven events, state patches. Oh, crap. <laughs> um, take one of them. That sounds good. Please. <laughs> Five Ziploc bags. Four hollow trees, three first finds, two travelers, and a full log book just for me. me. Yes, victory! <laughs> this is the height of public humiliation.